Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, November 13th, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week. Ah, this week, I have a lot to cover, but I think we'll have enough time to get it in. But just in case, I'm going to go and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew anyway. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this endorsement. But hey, PepsiCo, you out there. Give me a shout out. Community coffee. I'll, uh, I'll switch. I'll get off the do. Go to community coffee or whatever. Or anyone else out there. Red Bull saw it was too fat. I know. I say that every week. You guys are probably sick of hearing me say that. That just kind of gets me started here. Um, there's a disclaimer screen while I uh, slam this Mountain Dew. Take a look at that. Or just take a look at this. All predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, this is the part of the show where I beg for a review on Amazon. Sometimes there's more reviews up there. I'm sorry, sometimes there's more people here than there are reviews on Amazon. So somebody's holding out on me. Um, anyway, if you don't mind, the reason I ask is there's a few malignant people out there that review the reviews, and then they, they put a bad review up, and it has nothing to do with the book. They didn't even read the book. So if you read the book, you don't like the book, then by all means, uh, put what you feel up there. Like one guy said it was too much work, and I'm like, well, that's actually a compliment. It's anything worthwhile doing is worth working at a little, right? So I was okay with that, even though I only got uh, three stars out of five with him. Anyway, enough of that. Oh, my goodness. Looks like we got um, – Give me one second here. We had a computer issue right before. Let me make sure we got the right show loaded. Okay, I'm going to load a different show. Talk amongst yourself. Oh, here it is. Yeah, what happened? We had some computer issues right before him. Getting ready to transition to a brand new computer, but I just did so much work. It's just easier to stick with the old one sometimes. Anyway, so what we can talk about. Um. I want to touch base on classical technical analysis in reality. Uh, I talk about this quite often, but I just thought I wanted to put a graphic up. And to my surprise, I actually did put a graphic up a while back. But I think it's worth covering, again, because it's timely. As you know, I try to keep um, presentations timely to what's going on in the overall market. Uh, what else would it cover? Um, I want to cover, let me just get this pen working here. I want to talk a little bit about plausible scenarios versus predictions. And that was uh, sort of today's column, is that you have to come up with some plausible scenarios for what the market could do and what you think it might do. Uh, and that, that avoids having yourself being painted into a corner and, and stuck with your um, – Opinions, and I'll flesh it out in just one second. Got a couple of write-ins for some stock picks, and there's a few things left over from last couple of weeks. I'm going to leave um, in here. Okay, John, that's a good question. We'll uh, we'll cover that in just one second. Okay, before we before we get to John's question, which is relevant to what we're talking about now, um, I'm a big fan of classical technical analysis. The only problem with classical technical analysis is Let's say you read Schaubacher and you read um, Edwards and McGee, and then you read some of the newer classics such as Murphy's book, and or books, I should say, and Pring's book or books. And um, there's a couple other ones out there that, that escape me at the moment. But those are the, the main ones that, that you would probably or likely have heard of. And you're like, okay, I get it. A double top, a double bottom, a head and shoulders. And then you try to run out and trade these things. Well, you're going to find out real quick that the textbook versions that they show you, they work, but they don't always unfold in a textbook sort of manner. And before you use any pattern, just think of it in terms of the psychology of the market participants behind it, okay? So with a double top, it's sort of like the market gets to its old highs, and that is perceived as a, I guess, like an overvalued zone or whatever. And then people who might have bought late in the cycle 
might be looking to get out at break even when it gets back up to break even. So that's kind of what's going on with the double top. And I have to kind of uh, think about things to get my head wrapped around them before I actually use them in the real market. And I think you should, too. It, it needs to be conceptually correct to make a little sense. The reality, a lot of times with a double top, is that sometimes a market will rally back like it's going to go to that double top, but it'll stall short. So a lot of people are thinking, well, it's going to at least make it back to its old highs, okay, and then it rolls over. So anybody who thinks that gets trapped on the wrong side of the market. And then the second reality, sometimes that happens with a double top, is that it takes out the prior peak, and people think, well, that's the all clear. So it's safe to get in this market, right? And then, of course, it goes on to make its final top. It comes back in. So always keep these patterns in the back of your mind, especially when we're having this, this V-shape recovery like we're having now at such high levels. Now, John says, and I think it's I think this might dovetail in, and I just kind of glanced over the question. It says, uh, I th oh, okay, now Bruce says I'll drive you to drink. No, that's okay, Bruce. Um, Dave. Hi, Dave. You have mentioned on several occasions that you'd like to see the price action push through the prior high strongly and then pull back. Can you please elaborate on quantity, percent terms, what would be in practical terms? Okay. Well, it's kind of like, uh, what's his name, Justice Potter Smith. I'll know it when I see it. But ideally, you want to see a market get well past its prior highs. Now, I'm not giving you a, a, a true answer, but if it's way up here, then it begins to pull back, okay? Then you can look to enter when that market begins to resume that trend. And by the way, that's the beauty of trading a methodology or having a methodology in mind when you trade. So this market blasts through those prior highs. You wait for that pullback, and then you wait for that entry. Now, let's say this pullback becomes this. It looks something more like this and keeps pulling back, then you avoid a trade. So, and I'm going to probably harp on this a little bit more to show, you have to find a methodology that's plausible for you, that makes sense for you, and then follow that methodology, knowing that it's not going to be all things in all markets. But if you wait for your pitch, if you wait for the market to come to you, then a lot of times your life will get a lot easier. Now, here are some plausible scenarios, and then it uh, looks like my slide got wiped out. So down here was, um, let's just call this, uh, let's call this a blow off. And this is from fear of missing out. Let me just make this note here so I'll see it when I come down here. Um, now, when you fail to clear your prior peaks decisively, sometimes you get that wedging action, and that's what we're seeing like right now. In the S and P's, at least we have been seeing that. With the market, it sort of went straight up in here, and then now it's kind of like doing this. It's just kind of meandering off. Ideally, I like to see it blast off, have some pullbacks along the way, and then we look to get long rinse and repeat. The problem now is that if you have a meaningful correction at this juncture, that would create a reality number two scenario where we pull back in behind below the prior peak. And then if you, in the P's, you also have another peak back here. And it'll make a lot of sense when we get to the actual charts. Uh, so that's one of the possible scenarios that could play out, is that we've got this little wedging action in here. I'm sorry, let's do this. you got this little wedging action in here. And that kind of hints of like, well, the last of the people are kind of buying into it. It's last of buyers are buying in. And it's just barely enough to push the market higher. Whereas back here, it was obviously some serious buying, and now it's beginning to taper off. As I preach, I like markets to look like this. Okay, I like to see that buying slowly begin to accelerate because this means that more and more buyers are coming into the market. I don't like a market that does like this because that means that the buying is beginning to dry up. Okay, So again, a meaningful correction will put us back below the prior peaks. And the other concern is, how many times do I have to tell you? I have a web show every Thursday at 11 Eastern, 10 Central. They don't hear me. Um, margin call. <laughs> uh, anyway, the other thing that could happen, too, is your Johnny come lately. And, and those are the people 
when a market goes straight up like this and starts doing like this, the people that are buying in this wedge are sort of the last to join in. It's like they're kind of they're kind of throwing in the towel, so to speak, and they're just going ahead and buying the market. Okay. So these people can be kind of fickle. So when that market begins to correct, anybody who bought here quickly dumps the market. Okay. And then sometimes that selling can be getting more selling. Now let's talk about the FOMO. Uh, deal. If the market continues to make new highs, it makes new highs, it makes new highs, you end up with FO, EBO, FOMO, and the other thing is you end up with performance anxiety. P E R F O R M A N C. Performance anxiety. We just put anxiety. A N X. Okay, so you end up with performance anxiety. So fear of missing out and performance anxiety, they're sort of the same thing in a way. Um, like I wrote in a column this morning. If you are benchmarked to an index like the S&P 500, which a lot of people obsess over, and an S&P 500 keeps making new highs and making new highs and making new highs, then all of a sudden you might be forced in to chase that benchmark, or you might just be seeing it go up and there's a fear of missing out. Uh, as I've written recently, the fear of missing out is not nearly as strong as the fear of, uh, what's a good word for it? Fear of ruin, I guess. So if you're long a market and that market begins to implode, that fear, that watching your profits evaporate, or worse, watching your profits turn into a loss, that watching that loss get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, that fear is a lot more scarier than the fear of missing out. The fear of missing out is like, oh, it went a little higher. Oh, it went a little higher. And then finally you sort of, as I said a second or two ago, you sort of begin to throw in that towel. You begin to buy into the market. And that's kind of the drift I think we're seeing right now is those last of the buyers just kind of coming in. But if that market keeps going higher and higher and higher, then those who are benchmarked will likely be forced into the market, whether they like it or not. Um I know some big funds that sold out, and I think they did the beautiful thing, the right thing. When the market began to implode, just like we got short when that bow tie triggered, and we started getting shorts triggering, we did the right I think we did the right thing. I'll defend that forever. I didn't know the market would go right back up. There's a good chance it could have gone straight down and kept on going down. And I know some big funds that bailed out on that because they timed the market, which is brilliant and which is good. Now... Um, I haven't talked with any of these uh, gentlemen lately, but I'm wondering, and I, I kind of want to avoid talking to them for now because I don't want to get an opinion about the markets. Uh, I want to keep my own opinion. But I'm wondering if now they're going to be forced back in because they're forced to benchmark whether they like it or not and following their system. And if their system has to buy as the market's making new highs, just like I've been buying stocks um, or hypothetically buying stocks, I should say, for the momentum list that I track. I'm not actually putting 100 stocks into a list, but when they're making new highs, I'm forced to buy. Um, as a, That's been an ongoing experiment for the last four or five years. I've been doing that, and it's been a really good experiment. I don't want to digress too far on that, but there is a fear of missing out. There is a performance anxiety. You are forced in, especially as a trend follower, and especially as anyone who is, who is benchmarked to an index. So that fear of missing out, if that happens and the market keeps on keeping on, then it's going to force more and more people in. So what I'm proposing to you is two plausible scenarios. One, the market sort of dies out and rolls back over. And two, it keeps hitting new highs and new highs begets new highs. Now, I'm not talking out of both sides of my mouth. I'm just saying it's not an easy read right now. And it could, if it did either one, I would not be surprised at all so you kind of have to be what's the uh, eastern saying you kind of have to be like water and kind of go with the flow now the beauty of it is you just take things on a setup by setup basis and you don't have to figure it all out in fact figuring the overall market out is much harder than predicting individual issues now um, I had some a newer client bring up some very interesting facts. You always say you could only predict the short term when it comes to market when it comes to the markets. And he was thinking that I was going to predict every day, every market, and you can't do that. What you can do though is you can look at two thousand stocks 
common stocks, and then like I do every night, go ahead and look at a couple hundred IPOs too. And if you find one that you, that fits your methodology that you think can make a move, it's like find the one that fits your pattern. Don't try to make your pattern fit the the uh, the setup. Okay. So if you could find that one or two, or, or in good conditions, you could find a lot more than one or two. But in poor conditions, like right now, or questionable conditions, I should, I should say, like right now, there's not a whole lot of setups out there. And another reason there's not a whole lot of setups, before I digress too much further, but it's something that I need to say, is that the market's making new highs. So if the market is making new highs, then what happens? Well, if you trade pullbacks, it means that you look for a market to rally, then you look for a market to pull back, and then you look to enter, right? This is what we do, okay? This is our bread and butter. This is how we earn our keep, right? But if that market is just going, making new highs, the overall market, if this is the overall market here, then you're not going to see too many setups, okay, unless you have a rolling correction, meaning that subsectors begin to get hit on an individual basis. And we have seen a few TKOs lately, but they did trigger and the market kept imploding. So no capital was put into harm's way. Now, uh, John is saying there are also there are also breakout traders at that. Yeah, there's more than one way to trade the markets. And so your breakout traders are going are to be looking to, to trade that breakout, okay? Whereas I'm, I'm what, a pullback guy? I'm looking for this, okay? They're looking to get in as that market begins to break out. And that's possible too. And then you got relative strength players, which which some of these funds are run by uh, the ones that actually time the market. Which you know, God bless them, because I think that's what you should do. And but sometimes, the reason I say God bless them is sometimes, like now, it could be pretty tough. The market begins to roll over. You got to get out the way. What happens? It goes back up. Okay, and that's the that's the dilemma of trend following. And you're always going to be a little late to the party, but not too late to where you can't. Enjoy yourself, okay? So uh, the recent rollover, we were actually pretty early, but the market did materialize. But we, we were able to fire off a couple of shorts and then uh, got scratched out of some, made a little money on one, and we did okay. And that's what you do. You just follow the market along. Now, I don't want to digress too far, but it makes me think of what's going to happen when these this market doesn't come back this one time that it doesn't come right back because if you go in since 2009 the market what's the market done it's it's going up and then it's had some corrections along the way but it's always turned around and going right back up and we'll take a look at that in one second okay so that's the only problem that sort of also kind of has to be in the back of your mind should be in the back of your mind is that in a market, you get a new crop that comes along every few years. And the new crop, in this particular case, is going to be anybody who started trading in 2009. Let's say March or April 2009. April is when we first started seeing buy signals. But the uh, market bottomed out around March. Somebody emailed me a few days ago, hey, when did you start buying? Market bottom in 2009. What did you buy? I was like, well, it's bottom in March. I think we had setups in April. Go back and look at all of uh, the archives, and, and you tell me, but uh, they're out there if you want to look at it. But, yeah, we started seeing uh, a bunch of stocks, a lot of energy stocks bottomed out, some insurance stocks bottomed out back then, and we got sat ups pretty quick. So, yeah, you're a couple of weeks late to the party, but so what? You know, the party's been going on for four or five years here, and we've had some rollovers in between, which have kind of made it kind of difficult for us a little bit in between, but there's been some nice trends here and there. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that those who started in 2009 and have been long only oriented and rolled out all these corrections, the next correction that comes along, just like the last correction that came along, they're going to ride it out thinking that, okay, well, I'll just keep hanging on because they come back. I'm not going to get shaken out of my position. And that reminds me, it's like back in two, the early 2000, the market began to implode. I guess it was around March of 2000, March or April, and I asked someone who was long only oriented, and some of their stocks were getting torpedoed, like 50 bucks a day, I swear to God. Uh, it was ridiculous. Well, if anybody remembers how crazy it was. With, with those, you know, momentum does it badly. I'm, I'm the biggest fan of momentum, of momentum Town, but when it ends, it ends badly. And I was impressed because these guys are making all this money, but it's like, okay, well, what do you do? They don't seem to talk about stocks much, and I'm like, or at all. And I'm like, well, what do you do? And, and 
One of these guys says, well, you don't want to lose your position. I'm going like, what does that mean? It's like if you've got a position just with 50 points against you, uh, you should have lost that position a long time ago. So I, I guess the reason I'm, I'm digressing to that is that I, I see a new crop come along all the time, and it's like this market can be a, a bad teacher. It teaches you to have a permanent income hypothesis type of mentality, thinking that it will always come back. And one time it won't. So just just keep that in the back of your mind. And it might be a year from now. It might be. I hope it's. I hope it's five years from now. I hope you. I hope you never get to see it. I hope the market just goes up forever, and everything is just peachy and rosy. But the chances of that happen happening aren't that good. And we talked last week. I asked uh, people, and a lot of you guys are older than me, which is scary. But we talked about how many bear markets have you seen? Okay, and I've seen the. And how many? Um, how many big crisis type of events have you seen where when you're in the midst of it, it seems pretty ugly, like the Asian crisis, long-term capital management, things like that, okay? So these things do happen to a market, and the point I'm trying to make is keep that at the back of your mind when you're playing out these different scenarios. And then just follow along. And Again, you don't have to figure it all out. Just let the – database tell you what to do. If you start getting a lot of buy setups, then buy. If you start getting a lot of sell short setups, then sell short. It's like uh, best in show. You get hungry, eat something. Get tired, pull over. Okay. So if you're seeing buy setups, then buy. If you're seeing a lot of sell setups, then sell. If you're not seeing a whole lot of setups, either way, then for the most part, sit on your hands. Maybe nibble a little bit. But it always amazes me that portfolio ebb and flow can help to keep you on the right side of the market. When the market begins rolling over, you get stopped out of your longs. You start getting some shorts triggering. When the market begins making new highs, and then, of course, it's got to pull back at some point, so you get some setups. But you start getting long setups, and you start getting more and more long, and then what happens? Well, your shorts stop out. So letting that ebb and flow work easier said than done i know but if you get stopped out so be it when i get stopped out i'm glad to get rid of the stock and i know i can move on and, and, and when i have a losing stock in my portfolio it does kind of grate on me it does kind of bother me and it does kind of affect me psychologically because i got to look at that red number every day but the day it stops out i i, I used to get really pissed off because it would stop out oh, God, i'd get so mad and now it's like I, i'm not going to say i'm glad i'm not happy to have taken a loss but I find that it's now a release for me, and I now feel better getting that bad trade out of the way. And it's like the, it's like if you get enough bad trades out of the way, all the left are the good trades. And that's the kind of mentality. That's the Mark Douglas uh, speak coming out there. Okay. All right. Enough on that. Any questions on overall market prediction? Overall market's going to be more efficient than the over than the individual stocks because a lot of people are fighting it out tends to be choppier and harder to predict, although I think we still obsessed over it. I think we probably obsess over it too much, um, and you can't completely ignore it, obviously. You have to come up with some scenarios, and then if you have an actual setup, then life becomes a lot easier. It becomes a little bit more of a no-brainer, so like recently, we had the bow tie down in the S&P 500 from all-time highs. That was a no-brainer, and that could have turned into the mother of all tops. It didn't. But it could have, so you have to heed those warnings. All right, I don't want to digress too much further than that. Any questions on the overall market versus individual stocks? In the stock selection course, we spent a long time, probably about an hour, talking just about inefficiencies and efficient markets. And in an efficient market, everything tends to be priced in. It tends to chop around, whereas something inefficient is that little biotech stock or little solar stock that might go up 3 and 4 and 500 percent. Okay. Can I make it until 11 a.m.? Can you cover these stocks I, if I cannot attend, please? Okay. Kite, V-T-A-E and S-Y-F. Thank you, James. Well, Kite is on my Landry list for today, but we'll cover it anyway because I didn't have it. The thing I didn't like about Kite was I think it needs to pull back a little bit more. Now, you don't want it to pull back too much because then you have this sort of a base back here. But James is right. Kite is trending. James is on my service. He shouldn't be asking about stocks that are on the Landry list. 
uh, to be covered in the show. But that's okay because I prefer – I would like the stock to pull back a little bit more. I know it's kind of rallying today, but I prefer a little bit more pullback. But it's kind of like those one of those Goldilocks things. You don't want it to pull back too far because it will be back to the base. But in this particular case, based on the volatility – of this stock, based on the fact it's also a relatively new issue, what I would call, I wouldn't even call it a Tyler just yet. I still call it pretty much an IPO. I'd like to see a little bit more pullback. But, yeah, it did break out nicely from the base, began to accelerate higher, and it did pull back. So I think James has a good eye on that. I don't know if he was looking at my Landry list or not. I found it on his own. Knowing James, he found it on his own and then looked at the Landry list, but that's fine. He asked about VTAE. VTAE was actually bitched way back. In October, during the third follow-up session, I, by the way, I have one more session left to do to complete the IPO course. So anybody who, uh, shameless plug, anybody who buys the course still has access to that last session. It also has access to, obviously, all the material we've covered so far because it's a, it's a course and it's all been recorded. Uh, anyway, he asked about VTAE. Well, VTAE back on October 17th was a buy at eight and a half and i don't have the pattern in here because this is this has not been made public except for the ipo webinar but i'll give you a hint it's a breakout pattern okay and you can see here's a breakout pattern here but dave i thought you were a pullback guy i am a pullback guy but i have discovered that breakouts at least a specific type of breakout can work very nicely in ipos and the beauty of it is it either works or it doesn't, and you, when it does it, you most of the time, not all the time, because every now and then you'll get a stinker. I'm not going to say buy every breakout in the IPOs. There's some caveats there. But the thing that I've observed is more often than not, if you don't get a trigger, they don't work, and you avoid a lose. Well, if you don't get a trigger, you avoid a losing trade. But many times you won't get a trigger. If you go back to that list, which I can't show you at the moment because there's still some open trades in there, but in hindsight, maybe remind me a month or so from now, it will go back in that list of stocks, and you'll see that most of those stocks have not triggered yet, and they probably will never trigger. But take a look at this one stock here, this VTAE. It triggered, and from that trigger, and what was the trigger? Eight and a half? Right here, okay? From that trigger, so far, it's more than doubled up here. Now, I'm being asked for this as for a new setup. Well, the big blue arrow is certainly pointing up, and it certainly had a pretty good run, up about 100% or so. Uh, but I would wait for a pullback, and ideally I'd like to see it even go higher. I'd like to see it clear this prior little uh, high in here even more before pulling back. So James is asking about this one. Uh, I thought James was – James, you're not here yet. I think James was in the IPO webinar, so you should have seen this one a while back. Did I just rub salt in the wounds? I hope not. Uh, the next question is, yeah, we'll get to that. No, no, Baba was was not uh, an official breakout based on the aforementioned caveats that I have. However, based on the theory of the IPOs making new highs, uh, yes, it, it yes because. When I asked about BABA, I said, in order for me to buy BABA, it would have to take out its opening range high. That's the only time I would consider it. So, yeah, uh, we'll pull that one up in a few minutes. James also wanted to know about SYF. My only problem with SYF is um, it's a financial company, and financial companies aren't that exciting, okay? They're not splitting the atom or whatever. Um, and the other thing is that it ran from 24 to 29. Um, I mean, you could argue that's a base breakout, so that's not bad. So on a pullback, yeah, not not bad, but it's an IPO. And if you look at some of the excitement with these IPOs, sometimes you get a run like this where you get like a 100% run, okay? And that's the type of – that's really exciting. But, yeah, I can't fault you on this one, uh, James, because if it pulls back, it might be worth a shot, okay? A lot of questions. Yeah, let's just pull up Baba uh, because it, it's relative to IPOs. Yeah, let me get Baba pulled up because um, I get a lot of questions on that. Um, you know, I don't like these these overhyped, high priced IPOs when they come to the market like Baba. 
and uh, just hold off on the other stock questions for now until we get to the uh, actual stock. So I'll make sure I get to them. Um, I'm not a big fan of these high-priced, uh, overhyped IPOs. Uh, but yeah, your breakout there, even though I would not have recommended trading it, okay? But your breakout there is when it took out its opening range day high, okay? And this is the only time that this stock comes back on my radar. Somebody was asking me about here. Well, there's some caveats about back here I can't tell you about. But yeah, I did break out. If you were watching it back here, it did break out. There were certain things that did trigger back here. But I didn't like it just because it was a high price stock. Now, if it was down below my cutoff and I, start, I saw some of these things, then I might be a little bit more excited about it. But even from here to here, that's only a 15-point run, okay? And then by the time you even get the trigger in here, let me just even take a look at it. It's, it's probably not even that impressive. So, let's see. Yeah, I mean, you know, you got about 14 points, 13 to 14 points in the run. And the stock's $100 a share, so that's a 13% run. Well, yeah, it's better than a poke in the eye, but you're putting up a lot of capital to try to make 13%. Whereas, if you had a case like this, where you had this little, this little, uh, more speculative type of issue that sets up, you've got a chance to make 100% in that IPO. I doubt that Bob is going to go to 200. It might. It might double over time. Uh, if it did, it'd probably have a cap bigger than the NASDAQ, you know, or something something ridiculous like that. But I'd much rather trade in a issue in a smaller cap uh, issue that comes public at lower levels it isn't overhyped. Uh, when, when it's overhyped like that, it also, if you look at the offering price, I think the offering price on Baba was like 60, and then it came public around 99 or something like that. So it's like there's a big jump in there. So when you see that, when you see all that happen, there's not much left out there, okay? Only a 15-point run. Sign me up, Mike in. Well, okay, you have to, you have to take that relative to um, – well, okay, so you got 15, let's say you got 15 points. Well, it's more like 14, 13 to 14, okay? Well, how much do you want to make? Let's say you wanted to make um, $15,000 on that move, okay? So you need 1,000 shares. So what's 1,000 times 100? So you're going to put up $100,000, Okay, to try to make fifteen thousand dollars. Well, that's that's okay. I mean, that doesn't sound too bad, except for the fact that if this stock imploded on you, I mean, how much are you going to actually risk for that? And that's a lot of capital to put into harm's way. You put a, you got a hundred thousand dollars out there. Let's say they come out tomorrow, and I know this is going to be shocking to you, but you know. Some people actually, some people actually get all bent out of shape about this. It, it's a reality. I don't care, but they, they come out and say, "Oh, uh, Baba's been cooking the books." Okay, and this stock halves overnight. Now you've got a fifty thousand dollar loss on your hands, and what do you do? I mean, now you're like you're sunk, and then you're thinking, "Well, it'll come back," and then what if it drops further and further and further? I mean, a lot of what ifs in that scenario, but for me, it's just not worth it because I think your upside is fairly limited, whereas at these lower price IPOs that or uh, lower cap, lower price, lower cap, your chances for a big win are much better. But yeah, I mean, if you're following the breakout, if you're following the breakout um, aspect of this particular stock, you would have been, uh, there's two breakouts in here that I see, one around 90 bucks and one around recently. So, yeah, it's been a worthwhile run, but you do have to put up a lot of capital, and it is a big, thick, uh, overtraded type of IPO. So, I don't know. I think um, I think let it go. All right, I think we kind of beat Baba to death. Yeah, I mean, it's better than poking the eye. Okay, we'll come back to that one, Gary, uh, when we get to the charts. 
Okay. Now, a couple of things I just want to kind of uh, wrap up or kind of um, touch base on from last week. As you know, sometimes I'll leave some slides in as long as they remain relative to current conditions. Um, you know, I get a lot of questions about overbought, oversold. Well, last week we talked about using oscillators. I'm not a big fan of oscillators. Uh, and just for SGs, I plotted an oscillator this morning, which was uh, the oscillator was overbought last week. To guess what, it's still overbought this week. So sometimes oscillators can stay overbought for a long, long time. And that's why I think it would be dangerous to trade them. Um, the best way to for me to, to judge overbought, oversold is to eyeball it. Um, I, I find oversold could, could really, really, really become oversold because that panic – can really continue, and, and and you'd be surprised. Sometimes markets you think they're pretty low, and then they could even go lower. And it's not until they really are imploding, and it's been dropping for a couple of years, and then you see that that exhaustion move to the downside. And then you might want to think to lighten up a little bit, uh, not necessarily fight the trend or try to pick the bottom, but at that point, maybe you'll lighten up. But early in the cycle, I find a market could get very very oversold. Now the overbought was that the S&Ps went up about 11% from the reversal up until, I guess, the close about a week or so ago in 12 days. So it can't go up roughly a percent a day forever. And if you compound that out, I mean, we'd have an S&P at like 10000 by the end of the year or in the next year, I guess. So that can happen. Uh, historical statistical measurements, I don't do a lot of this, but I've been around long enough to look at the charts and say, Geez, I don't remember a move like this in a long, long time. And I was in a webinar a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I think John Netto pointed out some uh, some interesting statistics. And, and statistics are fun. Uh, go in and run some stats and see how far the market got stretched away from its moving average, see how many times it's happened in the past or whatever. And that gives you a good idea of how overbought the market really is. And... I used to do a lot of that stuff, and now just it's kind of it's. I find it just kind of academic, but it, it does have some purpose. It, it, but the reason I find it academic is because I already know it because I I could see it. Okay, you know it when you see it, and eleven percent in twelve days is fairly overbought. Um, but again, historical his statistical measurements can help, and again, overbought can always become more of a bought. And like I just said, oversold could become even more oversold, and that's why I put especially in there. And that's because, without going through all the details here, the main thing or one of the things is fear of going broke is much worse than fear of missing out, okay? Uh, seasonal biases. We do have a seasonal bias towards the end of the year, okay? The Santa Claus rally or whatever. Um, I don't get too excited about these type of things because... S&P 10,000 by next year, what did I miss? Well, if the market goes up 1% a day and then you compound that, um, we'd have a ridiculously high market. If the market goes up 11% every 12 days, I, I didn't do the math on it, but I'm guessing if you compounded that out, then it would compound out pretty quickly. Okay, what do you got, 250, roughly 250 trading days, so that would be 25 compounding periods. Um, maybe it won't be 10,000, but it'll be at least two or three times higher than it is now. And obviously that type of market is not sustainable. So seasonal biases, well, like I said last week, I got asked about this. And you can't bet on a seasonal bias. If anything, you could maybe bet against a seasonal bias, provided you have signals, okay? So signals first and foremost are what's most important. So if the market's going up and we have this so-called Santa Claus rally or seasonal rally or whatever you want to call it, then I'm going to be a buyer, and I don't care about the seasonal bias, okay? Now, if I have a sell signal, then I'll take a sell signal, and that's when your sell signals will work best. So I think if, the, if you have a seasonal bias, and then the market does the opposite. That's when the real money can be made. I don't think the real money is made following a seasonal bias. Let's say you just traded a seasonal. You know, somebody implied that I should be long just because it's a seasonal bias. Well, 
the market's only been actively trading, at least U.S. markets, for what, about 100, 100 or so years, okay? And so you really don't have a representative statistical sample. And I don't want to get into too much trouble telling you how little I know about statistics. Um, I mean, statistics are really worthless. Everybody, so, oh, I'm sorry, 73% of all people know that. But you really don't have a statistical sample with 100 measurements of seasonal bias because the, that could not work for several years in a row, and then that statistical bias would still be fairly relevant. So that's the problem you get into with, with something that doesn't have uh, a bias in it or a statistical, um, what am I looking for? A representative sample, I think is what the statisticians call it. So that's where you got to be careful. But if people psychologically are expecting a rally, which, which people often do, and that rally doesn't materialize, and this could be corn or soybeans or wheat or pork bellies or, or anything. It doesn't have to be stocks. Okay? And if they're expecting that seasonal bias to push the market higher and the market doesn't go higher, if it actually goes the other way, that's when sometimes you can get a really good trade in. So if it, it's kind of like the news, you know. If I'm going to trade, yeah, I don't, I don't trade the news. But if you were to trade the news, fade the news, okay? Seven hundred ninety-two percent over two hundred twenty days, one percent a day. All right. So the market would be, let's just say, eight times what it is now, sixteen thousand. If that, uh, thank you, Phil. And that's uh, it's about two hundred fifty trading days a year, uh, in case you're. Um, adding them up so it's 52 weekends times two, 52 weekends times two is 104 days uh, was it 365 365 minus what is it uh, what did I just say 104 104 days equals 261 and there's about uh, 10 holidays minus 10 so 250 251 days is uh, I've always used 250 because it's a nice round number for the number of trading days a year okay we take vacations. <laughs> oh, you got you guys have you got your markets closed more than ours? Wow. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. It's like I wish uh you know, I used to hate the weekends because the market was closed and now it's like I I still like the market being open. I still enjoy the markets, don't get me wrong, but I look forward to those weekends now. Uh trust me on that. And I wish we had more market holidays now. It's like I think you I think you need a break. It's okay to be obsessed. But at some point, you got to start taking a break, okay? Also, though, throw into throw into the pot the forex rigging that has recently proved recently, although everything else uh, the banks have rigged, along with everything else. But yeah, I guess the dollar's been going higher. That's a that's a no brainer, okay? Oh, well, you take vacations, okay? Good. Oh, good for you. I don't even know what I don't know what a vacation is. I, I, <laughs> my laptop is uh, chained to my waist when every time I go somewhere. So, but that's okay. I mean, this is a lifestyle that I have chosen. I'm very happy. I mean, I'm. I'd say I'm in my underwear today, but I've got some jeans on. It's kind of cold outside. So, uh, only had, now I had to throw a suit on. Every, well, not a suit, just a t-shirt and a jacket. It's still got shorts on. Every um, Monday, I've been hosting a show where the webcam's actually turned on. Uh, again, do you really need to predict the overall market? It, indices are efficient. It's a very tough game. Listen to the database, as I've been saying. Um, in overbought markets, you're not going to get any, a lot of new longs. In an oversold market, you're not going to get a lot of new shorts. So it sort of self-regulates itself anyway. So if the market is doing this, I'm getting ready. I'm ready to jump into the charts. So just let me finish it real quick. Uh, if the market's doing this, you're not going to get any new longs. If the market's doing this, you're not getting any new shorts. But once it begins to pull back, okay, right here you're going to get a lot of new longs, and right here you're going to get a lot of new, I should say, potential shorts. So, again, just let the let the ebb and flow control things. Let the stops keep you in positions or take you out of positions and let entries put you into um, new positions. And entries are a pretty amazing thing, uh, especially like if you get like a TKO pattern, where you have a market that's just kind of working its way higher, and then bam, you get that big knockout move. If that market makes it all the way back to that that high here, then you might have the mother of all trades. But more often than not, it'll rally up and then die, and you miss a losing trade. So entries are a wonderful thing, and it's, I kind of hinted at this um, in one of my recent columns. Avoiding 
losing trades is very, very hard to quantify, but uh, very important. And the more losing trades you avoid, the more successful you're going to be, okay? But very hard to uh, quantify. Okay, uh, announcements, uh, flash drives, 2014, uh, special right now. You get the whole year up until now, and then I'll even give you access to the downloads for the remainder of the, of the year if you're interested in those. And this is just the first half of the year. These are all the things that we covered, um, plus a lot more. You know me. I get off on some rants in here. Uh, this special ended. i got to fix this slide. Right now, the special is uh, with the stock selection course is if you buy the stock selection course, you get one year of the service free. The IPO course is still available too, and you get uh, you still have access to that last uh, thing there. All of this, just go to the store on the site. This is how we pay for all this webinars and such, and go to webinar and everything. Go to the store and check out the IPO course, and then check out the stock selection course for more than that. Again, a stock selection course, one year of the service free, um, which costs more than the actual course. Uh, so you you would be smart to get the course uh, as opposed to just the service by itself for a year. And then the IPO course uh, has one more follow-up session plus recordings to all the access to everything else. I think that's it for now. Um, let's go ahead and hop into the overall market. It's got a question. But we'll come back to that one, Gary. Um, let me go ahead and get the charts uh, up. Uh, let's talk about the overall market first, and then let's uh, work our way into the um, your stock picks. Uh, when you do ask about a stock, if you don't mind, just ask about one. To those who are new to the show, uh, just ask about one stock at a time. That way, uh, I'll know whether I covered it or not. Okay. Good job, John. See, I like that. I like saying why you're not only the stock, but why you like it. That's a uh, that's a good point. All right, let's take a look at the P's in here. And this is the this is the doesn't take a rocket science part about the market being overbought. Um, it sold off hard. Remember, we had that bow tie back here somewhere. In fact, we could see exactly where it was. Yeah, right in there. You had a bow tie. And to me, this looked like the mother of all tops, especially since it had a bow tie back here that didn't really materialize or did barely even triggered. Okay. But then you had one that triggered nicely and sold off about 8%. And then the market went right back up. Now, I'm not that excited about this bow tie because it's a bow tie coming off of high levels. I'd be more excited about like a bow tie in like 2009. Let's just digress for a second and take a look at that. Okay, so you had 2009, market went down, went down, 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 and then begins bottoming out. Now watch what's going to happen. Bam, 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 bam. You got a bow tie now, okay? So now you got a bow tie at the end of March. Now you're a little late to the party. You didn't catch the exact low. But now you can see the market bow ties, and then that was the ultimate bottom. And then we've been generally heading up since then. The only problem with the since then in that sentence is this is a weekly chart, is there have been some pretty serious corrections throughout. Corrections where if you didn't exit your longs and start shorting the market, then you should be questioned as a trend follower. Okay, and that's the problem I alluded to earlier is that people may have become spoiled. Now, cleaning this chart up a little bit, we see that the market pretty much imploded and then all of a sudden decided it was going to go straight back up. And that's fine with me. I don't care. I think Gary Kaulbaum once said, give me an uptrend, a downtrend, or a ticket to Tahiti, right? My only concern is that we really haven't cleared this, this prior peak decisively in here. So if the market does begin pulling back, if we get below 2,000, I think I would be pretty concerned about the overall market. The other problem is that peak is just above the July peak. So if we drop below 2,000, then you've got uh, half a year wasted in the overall market, and it could get pretty ugly pretty quick. But let's not get too excited. Let's just take things one day at a time. Again, though, we still have this drift action going on in here. So the market looks like this. 
and then it looks like that as opposed to like this and like that and that's what I like okay but as long as it can keep, keep making new highs then maybe some of those aforementioned setups could occur like somebody in here is asking John's asking about a TKO in a stock which we'll get to in a minute you might get some TKOs along the way um, you might get a rolling correction like I said biotech got hit hard recently at least on an individual issue basis we got a few setups there none of them triggered and took off or anything but hey nothing bitch enough to gain in fact the good thing is no capital was put in harm's way and we just have to wait again. Some women say, Dave, I can't ever see where we'll have another setup. It's like, no, 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 don't be so negative. There will be setups, trust me. And even if the market is making new highs, eventually you will get either a correction to the overall market or, uh, like I said a minute ago, you'll get a rolling correction where certain sectors like biotech will get hit. You'll get some setups. And if everything continues on, then you'll be able to get get on. Um, but, yeah, there's old there's some old Wall Street adages. Um, a bull market never lets you in, and a bear market never lets you out. Well, there's some truth to that because it's like right now, it just seems like it keeps going up, going up. And like, what do you do? Do you throw in the towel and buy at these at these high levels that it's overbought, or do you just wait? And I think, believe it or not, I think wait, or at least wait for those individual setups. We got one thing we're looking at today coming into today, and if it triggers, we'll be long one more stock. Okay, but that's it. We're not looking to rush out. And by the overall market, especially now that it's so overbought, we're waiting for setups. So, but so far we really had a correction from this this um, upward drift. Ideally, I'd like to see it actually blast higher. Like, like I can't really draw it on this screen, but I'd like to see it blast higher, not look back for a while, and then have a pullback. Okay, and I think that would be the best scenario. But this is kind of a hard market to trade in here. I'm glad it's making new highs, don't get me wrong, but it's a little tough market to trade because it is remains overbought. It's just kind of in this drift mode. And the drift mode means there's no real serious buying at this juncture. Now the NASDAQ looking a little bit uh, different in here as far as the wedge is, is concerned because it has been kind of wedging up in here, but then it kind of broke out today. Now it's kind of coming back in. Uh, to that wedge already. So that's a little bit of concern too. Same thing in the NASDAQ that we really didn't clear, let's just say 4,600. We really didn't clear that that decisively. And even back to July, that July peak is not too far below. It's about 4,500, right? So if we come back below this level, then we're going to have like a, a possible uh, triple top in the works. And just like any other technical analysis pattern, it, it often doesn't unfold in a textbook kind of manner because in that particular case you might have and I'm not a huge fan some people call it say three drives to a high uh, I'm not a huge uh, fan of that I think it's borderline uh, uh, counting waves or whatever which I'm not a, a definitely not a fan of but but sometimes you do get a market it'll kind of make like three drives to a high well all that is like the double top it's a triple top okay except that the, the market actually makes marginal new highs on each one. And each new high is less impressive. So it makes a new high. It's kind of like off to the races. And then it kind of makes another new high. And if you draw a line from there to there, it really didn't do a whole lot. And then from there to there, it just kind of, uh, it sort of fades out. So it's like a new high, another new high, and then a marginal new high from there. So that's one of the scenarios that could play out, uh, too, in the indices. But so far, um, you know, this NASDAQ just kind of drifting in here. A little concerned about this tailing higher action today. I'm not going to turn into a candle guy on you. Don't worry about that. But it is kind of interesting that when you do get a tail higher like this at these levels, it does hint. Now, this is kind of a small tail. It's not that big of a deal. But if you got a really big tail higher and the market came right back in, it would hint to the fact that maybe that buying, at least shorter term, has exhausted itself, okay? Uh, most sectors looking pretty good here at a new, new year, near new highs, he tried to say. Uh, that's insurance. Uh, take a look at, like, drugs uh, at or near new highs. Biotech, drug delivery, uh, drug delivery banging out new highs decisively. Biotech, kind of a little stealthy in here, but closed at new highs, or, or just yesterday was right at new highs. 
Today it's uh, going to close the new highs if it can hold on to its gains. I think it's given up a little bit already. Uh, health services, uh, today's action so far, this is not real time, this particular chart. But earlier today it was actually begging out new highs in here. Uh, health care plans right around these new highs in here. Retail has been pretty amazing. Retail was all over the place. And then all of a sudden they decided to just go straight up. Okay, And that's fine. Somebody was asking me earlier about what happens when uh, at what point would I say, oh, it's no longer a double top? Well, yeah, look at the retail. You've had this nice breakout. Okay, you could have a pretty serious pullback in here, and then I think it'd be worth trading to the upside. Okay, because it's got to come all the way back down before it would be below its prior peak. So that's a little bit different than like the S&P, which is just kind of crawling higher above the prior peak in here. And then again, we're getting that tailing action. Today, black swan forming. Well, the pro, you know, um, I had a black swan literally land in my pond a while back. I, I can't find the pictures. I got to find the pictures. I was telling the client, they, they just didn't believe me. I'm like, I'm telling you, there was a black swan in my pond, and some bad things actually happened in the market shortly thereafter. <laughs> I don't want to go nuts on you or anything, but it was kind of like ironic. It's like, oh, okay, well, uh, that's the deal. But um, it's not wasn't that big of a shocker because a neighbor actually had two black swans in his pond that were uh, that became his pets, and these black swans just showed up out of uh, nowhere. We talked to the guy because we had this black swan for a couple of days in our pond. We're like, "Hey, is this your swan?" He's like, "No, I still got my swans. I don't know where that one came from, but maybe it just showed up." Uh, they're from Australia, is where they're from. And they're beautiful. They have they're black, 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 and they have an orange, very orange beak. And the black swan theory is just because you've never seen one doesn't mean they don't exist. And if you go back to the 2009, just because you've never seen a market sell off hard doesn't mean that it can't sell off hard. And I think there's enough gauging from the age of some of you guys that are here today. I think you've seen some black swans. In your day, Black Swan is Talib's. Uh, he 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 coined that phrase, and these these dangerous or these crazy outliers happen a lot more than statistics would suggest. Uh, markets, uh, some people call it a fat tail. I think so does Talib. Um, it makes for an interesting read, but it's just depressing. I find reading about that kind of thing. Especially when you've had a lot of first-hand knowledge with some black swan uh, market situations, not necessarily in the pond. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I, I guess these black swans, uh, the, the ones that the, getting back to the, the foul, um, I, I guess that these are probably people have hatched them and uh, from from eggs. It's not illegal to own a black swan, and then I guess they got they've gotten loose in, in the wild. And I actually looked up black swans, and, and there are. They do occasionally find them in Louisiana. Um, they're not prevalent, but they do they do occur. And I I had one in my pond, so they do occasionally show up. Anyway, enough of the black swan. But uh, yeah, the problem with 2009 um, is that the market is just going up in here, and you've had these big corrections throughout, and we just saw one, and a lot of people have just kind of held through those. Well, the problem is you don't know if that correction is going to become like this. I mean, if you've been around the block a time or two, and, and some of you guys in here have been around a lot longer than I have, but you've seen things like a market in 2000, the NASDAQ lose 80% of its value. And that's, that's, a, that's a, a move that you could not fathom. I mean, if you went on CNBC and, and, or Bloomberg Television and talked about that the market would lose 70, 80 percent of its value, they probably take you out and shoot you. Okay, they certainly wouldn't believe you, but it did. Okay. All right, let's look at a few more sectors. Most sectors doing pretty good in here. Leisure popping out the new highs, although leisure, that's that V-shaped problem yet again. Okay. Uh, doing okay. Uh, utilities kind of pulling back in here a little bit. Not that excited about utilities. The HV is pretty low on those guys. Uh, chemicals keep clawing their way back. You know, that's something that's kind of interesting in some of these areas that really look like they were rolling over are kind of clawing their way back, and they're not that far from new highs. The energies have just kind of been chopping around in here. They're kind of turning back down again. 
but they're certainly losing downside momentum, and they've been going sideways for about a month in here. Metals and mining still look abysmal, and this is why you don't want to bottom fish, even though like the energies look like they were kind of going sideways in there. Take a look at gold, rallied up a little bit. I, they, last week, somebody wanted to bottom fish there, and my answer was, no, <laughs> no, don't do it. So Okay, um, any other, I think that's it for the sectors. Most sectors are still going higher. Uh, most sectors still look pretty good in here. Uh, my only, there's only one or two that kind of stand out. I mean, obviously, then the other ones that are going straight down. But um, semis have got me a little bit concerned in here because they've kind of stolen short. They made a pretty impressive recovery so far, but they've kind of stolen short of their prior peak in here. So getting back to that graphic we did a little while ago, it's kind of like now you got a triple top. And is the triple top going to be a perfect triple top, or is it going to stall short of that triple top like it's kind of doing right now and then roll back over? I'm kind of old school, and then I like I, that I like – I'm kind of new old school. Um, old old school is worries about the transports a lot. The transports must confirm what's going on in the market. The transports have been confirming, as you know, what's going on in the overall market because notice that they are up here. These are the Dow theorists. Well, I'm kind of old new school in that since around the late 90s, mid to late 90s, I've liked to watch the, uh, I have liked, I like to watch the semiconductors to make sure they confirm what's going on in the overall market. So ideally, not that the market can't rally without the semis, but I like to see the semis make some new highs in here. And that's one of the, one of the few areas that has me a little concerned. It's totally short of its highs, okay? Uh, please note, all indices are making new highs, but the advanced decline line has failed to make new highs. Uh, that's a good observation. I don't pay. I used to pay a lot of attention to uh, advanced decline lines and a lot of things like that, and I did a lot of market analysis. In fact, I'll show my age here. Uh, Metastock used to have a package called the Technician, and um, I've got it around here somewhere. I, I, I used to keep old computers around just so I could run these things because it's kind of fascinating, but... Uh, they had data going back hundreds and hundreds of years, or over 100 years, I should say, and a lot of that uh, really fascinating information. Um, but, yeah, that's that's something that I will see empirically is that when the markets, if let's say the markets make a new highs and I start seeing fewer and fewer stocks making new highs, but I, I can't find any stocks to put in my momentum list, then I'll know that internally it's beginning to weaken a little bit. But, that, you know, there's nothing wrong with taking a look at the advanced decline line. So that's interesting, okay? All right, let's open it up to individual stocks. And uh, if you've got any questions about the overall market, we could do that. Uh, we can come back. Um, Gary asked early in the show, he says, uh, what was it about SWR that you did not like last Thursday? I'm trying to learn. Uh, I'm trying to learn. I would have bought a little. Um, well, one, two, three, four, five. I mean, that was just a breakout, and we're not breakout traders, so um, there was nothing there for me to buy. Now, this doesn't – it's not my way or highway. Maybe there's some other kind of pattern there, but that jump from 26 to 30-something overnight, that's a pretty big jump, and it's kind of dangerous to just jump in uh, that market midstream, okay? Now, I do keep momentum list, and, and as a general statement, nothing is too extreme for the momentum list. So I might put this at a momentum list, but I won't actually rush out and buy it. Remember, we're pullback players. So maybe in a pullback, we might go after it. And the methodology is not going to be all stocks in all markets. It's going to be a little bit more selective. I'm going to be host again for uh, timingresearch.com's webinar on Monday. And um, check my uh, – I'll put out a post tomorrow or I'll put it in a newsletter tomorrow, and I'll put a countdown on the website too for that. So if you guys want to join us, we have a pretty good show uh, going on. I've just been asked to be the guest host. I'm not actually affiliated with them, but uh, I was on a show a couple of weeks ago, and he asked if I'd be willing to guest host, I guess because I'm a ham. Anyway, um, in this week's question is going to be like, do you trade multiple methodologies or just one methodology? Now – that question, you could tell, is a little bit loaded, and the uh, the host of the show, if you kind of uh, read into it, 
actually got to pick that question, right? Because you know how I feel. I think you just trade one methodology. And sometimes you just have to let them go, okay? There's more than one fish in the sea. We got a couple thousand tradable stocks out there at least at any given time. And there's a couple hundred IPOs. And from those, there's a few that might be worthwhile. So like a bus, there'll be another one along soon. So don't beat yourself up if you miss the move in a stock and it was, that was on your radar. I like this SWR. Um, but I see no reason or there's no setup of mine that would have bought that stock just because it's making new highs. Now, in an IPO, as I said earlier, there is a breakout characteristic that I think is worth trading. Now, it's, I don't have enough time to get into in this webinar, but I did explain in a lot more detail in the course. But there's a lot, there's a better chance of a breakout working in an IPO for a variety of reasons. Again, not enough time to get into it today, but uh, just for the most part, uh, there's not as many bad memories, I guess would be the Reader's Digest answer to that. So, there's not as much hindrance to the stock going higher. So a breakout pattern can actually work, and it does work really nice. Okay. Did I ever use Fast Track? No, I'm trying to think if I actually had um, – his name always escapes me. Fast Track, and then what was the other one? I've used a little bit of everything. I've, I've, uh I've had Metastock from day one. I've had add-ons of Metastock. I discovered Telechart um, and StockFinder uh, in more recent years. But uh, more more Telechart for my scanning. Metastock for Metastock's great for looking at certain markets a certain way. You can set up your charts exactly how you want them. That's what I like that for. I've used Metastock on and on throughout the on and off throughout the years. Um, it's been uh, a good program to use too, but uh, Telechart, I use that a lot, obviously. But yeah, I used to use add-ons. I used to use add-ons to Metastock that actually made it behave more like Telechart. If that made any sense, makes any sense. It was a technical analysis scanner or something. Okay, boot long a little. All right, let's take a look at that. Supercharts, yeah, I remember that. Boot, yeah, I used to use supercharts, which was. Um, Oh geez, that was I forget what that was. Uh, Trade Station used Trade Station for a long time. Uh, yeah, Boot is um, Boot is actually a buy at this level as a breakout. Real thin though, be careful. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a breakout based on um, without giving the system away. Maybe you figured it out by now. But yeah, based on a breakout in the IPO system. My only concern is and this is where you got to be careful because if you do have the IPO course, you'll know I talked about Lulamon. Had a beautiful setup, and I didn't take it because I made fun of them making yoga clothes. So these people making boots, eh, they're not splitting the atom. One has to wonder uh, how well they can really do. But, yeah, in a case like this stock, I think it's close your eyes and buy, okay? <laughs> Got a candidate in one of my elections over here. I know you don't like me. I <laughs> Just close your eyes and push the button. It's like, okay. <laughs> It's getting kind of messy down here in Louisiana. I guess it's messy everywhere with, when elections are concerned. Yeah, so Boot's fine. Hey, Don's here. He wants to know about anybody? Anybody? Ford. Um, well, we had a nice little breakdown of the bow tie. It's trying to bottom out in here. It's got a lot of bad memories. I mean, it's a big, thick stock. It's nothing that I really like uh, that much. What did I do with that? Let's see if I have it here somewhere. Nope. I wanted to have it live for the show today. Uh, let's see something. Well, I can't get it up. Next next week I'll have a little surprise for you for the electrocardiograms. But, yeah, it's working its way higher. It's going to have bad memories. There's nothing for me to get excited about there. CHRS on a pullback. Uh, yeah, I like that stock. Uh, CHRS. Yeah, I mean, it's already kind of pulled back. This one actually has... Um, this is one that's on my radar from the IPO. Go in and watch the IPO course, and you'll get the uh, you'll get the entry on this one. But yeah, I like it. That's good eye. Thin, thin, thin. Now, as a private trader, we can take these, so be careful. Pan W, another nice seminar. You're welcome, Steve. Pan W or Steven, I should say. Uh it's trending. 
it's choppy, but it's trending, and it just doesn't have much acceleration. So for me to get excited, it would have to kind of begin to accelerate higher and then pull back. Now, with that said, again, my methodology doesn't always catch everything, and this might be more of a box stock, meaning that it makes kind of a box, Darva style, jumps up, makes another box, and jumps up, makes, makes another box. Sometimes I'm lucky to get in those because I'll get um, – a first thrust or a bow tie or a pullback or something like that, and then the stock turns into a box stock, meaning that it doesn't really set up its pullbacks, but it consolidates, kind of makes a leap up to a new box, consolidates, and keeps doing that. Um, if you get a chance, read the book. You probably get it for five bucks. Uh, it's, it's there's a link somewhere on my website. It's uh, How I Made Two Million in Stock Market by Nicholas Darvis. It's a good uh, it's a good read. It's a simple little book. Good little book if you don't believe in technical analysis, or if you do. Either way, on Swear Volume gave a clue as to the strength of the breakout. Do you not use volume at all? Do you not use volume at all? How do you answer that? Do you not use volume at all? Uh, do I not use volume? Do I not use volume? Yes, I think is the answer to that question. My wife's like, did you not do this? I'm always like, yes. Well, did you or did you? I'm like, I answered the question. <laughs> no, I don't use volume at all. Um, I can take either side of the coin when it goes to volume. That's that's a long, that's another. I've spent enough time beating that dead horse. Uh, but hey, it's not my way or highway. If you have a, if you find a use for it, then it might be worthwhile. One thing I've noodled with a little bit, and I haven't played with it lately because um, I haven't gotten around to booting up my uh, stockcharts.com account. But if you look at stockcharts.com, you could do a volume by price, DBT, um, and it, does, it doesn't really indicate anything, but it kind of wakes you up to the fact that, like, volume by price would probably, in this particular stock, would probably have a lot of volume right around this area. And so if the stock pulled back, that would probably be a support level. So if I had to, I think I would use volume by price. I have noodled with that a little bit. Um, I saw Linda Rasky speak at one of our uh, American associations of professional technical analyst meetings, AAPTA, and she was talking a little bit about volume by price. It's kind of like a, a market profile type of thing, or it's, it's similar to market profile. Um, not a huge fan of market profile or volume by price, but I think there's something there. But the, the bottom line is it just shows you what's already in the chart to begin with. So anytime I find myself kind of, wandering off the path a little bit, experimenting with something, I find myself coming right back to the path because it's like, well, it just kind of tells me what's already there. And that's what happened with volume by price. So, uh, But, yeah, that's as close as I've ever come to using volume. ORB as a short, ORB. Uh, I think it's in trouble, Phil, but it's a bit of an electrocardiogram. I mean, I hear you, okay? It's sometimes these unorthodox kind of setups could actually work. You got a big gap down. You got a pullback. You got a mountain of overhead supply. I'm going to give you an okay on that one. It's just a little wide and loose and crazy. But, yeah, I hear you. I can't argue with you too much on that one. A little thin for a short, but um, I think that stock is certainly in trouble. That's a faux show -off. Fidelity has price volume distribution on Active Trader Pro. Okay. Um, yeah, stockcharts.com is pretty good for stuff like that. I got to get my account um, up and going there again. I haven't used it in a while. Um, my buddy Greg Morris is actually part owner of that, a small part owner of that company. I think he was a bigger part at some point. Got bought out. NMIH. But yeah, you could you you know I, I like TC to do a lot of stuff I do, but there are some other packages out there that can actually help you out. And it doesn't have to be you know if you go in my garage, I have a tool fetish. Okay, I've got every tool you could ever imagine. My friends make fun of me because they're like, "Oh, give me can I borrow a hammer?" It's like, "Well, I can't find a hammer, but do you, do you need a <laughs> do you need a hammer drill? Do you need a <laughs> do you need a? Um, I even have a uh, what do you call it? I even have a rebound hammer. You know, it's like a you need a rebound hammer? No, I just need a hammer. It's like, oh, I, I got to dig for one. I got to find one. Here, use this rock. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, NIMH, yeah, it looks like a bottom in here. It's got a lot of overhead supply, a lot of bad memories to it. 
I hear you though, and let's put in a. Um, it's a little thin, uh, but yeah, you got a bow tie in here. It looks like a bottom. It's got a lot of overhead supply. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Um, well, that's as far as it'll back out. It must be a relatively new issue. Yeah, my only problem is just a lot of overhead supply. I hear you though. It's bottomed out. It's made the bow tie. It looks like it's turned a course, uh, turned a corner, I should say. But it's going to have a lot of uh, trouble to get through like 11 and 12. Okay. What about Cloud TC? Okay. Um, I haven't used it much. I'm still on the old one. You have it for free. Oh, price volume. Web TC has price volume. Oh, well, good. Okay, that's good to know. A cloud. Okay. So the newer version of TC does have price volume. Oh, that's good to know. Cool. I'll I'll play with it someday. I had it up and running for a while, but I got um, busy doing other stuff. Uh, John's been patiently waiting for ATRA. Uh, yeah, this is one that uh, I think triggered. Uh, am I along this one? I don't know. Uh, it triggered. This was in. This is one that we covered in the IPO webinar. And uh, the only problem is the the TKO. Maybe I'm splitting hairs a little too much. I'd like the TKO to not be on a new high day because when you're buying into it, you'd be buying a new high. But, yeah, keep that one on your radar as a possible pullback. I don't know if I would trade it right at this high. Let's see if it pulls back a little bit and trade it more like a pullback. Okay. But, yeah, this one did break out. We talked about this one a while back. You can see I've got it drawn in. Your buy on this one was right back here. And I think that's one of the stocks that's in the uh, in the list. Dr. Dr. Jerry's here. He, was, he could maybe – attest to that. SLW for Dr. Jerry. SLW. Um, yeah, this is a silver stock, and the problem is it's too early to go long something like this, because if you draw your big arrows, you could see it's still headed lower, and you're fighting an uphill battle, and we talked about silver last couple of weeks. In fact, let's just let's just take a look at the sector here. Let's jump to the sub-industry. And you can see here's silver overall, the stocks at least. It broke down out of this range. Okay, Right around here, people, a lot of questions. Hey, Dave, should I buy silver stocks? I'm like, no. And they, they pull back a little bit. And look, bam, they're making a new low again. Okay, So, so far, the silver stocks are just headed lower. You're fighting a, a downhill battle or you're fighting an uphill battle. I guess you're buying them. SLV. Uh, and notice that silver, the commodity, kind of looks a lot like the stocks, right? Took out all these lows in here. It looked like the mother of all base. It, it, trust me, I was hoping it would be, okay? And then it took out the bottom of that base, and now it's way down here, okay? Boy, I had a lot. I sent a lot of uh, physical silver I could have sold. But I, it's, a lot of it belonged to my grandmother and all, so I can't. But I digress. <laughs> I feel guilty. <laughs> Rocks for Andre R O X. Uh, maybe at a pullback. Uh, certainly, I, I could see where you're coming from. Um, for the most part, it looks like it's headed higher in here. Yeah, why not on a pullback? Uh, maybe on a pullback. It's kind of um, thin given the price of the stock, but I hear you. S H L X. That's going to be a dog, I think. No, maybe not. Let's think of something else. Um, there's nothing here for me just yet. It would actually have to rally uh, up a little bit more and then maybe pull back. Okay, but yeah, it's on my list as a possible IPO, but it's it hasn't it doesn't show me anything just yet. Play. P L A Y. Um. It's a restaurant. It's kind of hard to get excited about. There was a buy in this one around 18, okay? Uh, it's only up to about 22. I'd actually like to see it rally a little bit more than maybe pull back. Kind of more of a show me on that one. NMIH. Did we do that one already? NMIH. Yeah, we did that one. Hubs for Howard. Uh, maybe on a pullback. It's had an okay run. It's about a 10-point run. Um, you know, like the DTAE went up 100%. That's like, almost like to see a, a, a pretty impressive run. But, yeah, on a pullback, I think it could probably do something. BBW. Hey, it's the holidays. What is BBW? 
BBW. Build a bear. Oh, okay. I I think I I know another acronym for BBW. <laughs> Uh, yeah, on a pullback, sure, why not? Uh, if it pulled back a little bit more, I'd, I'd like to see a little more knockout move. To, because it's sort of like, oh, it broke out, let's all buy it, then then now what? Also, a little bit uh, thin. I don't know. It's you know, I have a hard time. See, this is where I kind of confuse the issue with facts that I should, but it's like, uh, I mean, what, you, you go there, you build a bear, you know? Uh, I don't know. It's To me, it just seems hard to get excited about, but I guess I don't have my children or, or grown past that phase now to me it just seems like a ripoff but hey i'm confused the issue with facts so if it does yeah if it did pull back a little bit further then uh i'd be forced to look at it spnc for mr phil spnc uh my problem here is that you got this one big day for this up move and then it just kind of drifted higher eh, it's a little bit more than a drift it looks okay uh but it had to pull back just a little bit more than when it's pulled back. But ideally, it's like I'd like to see just the opposite happen. I'd like to see all these days in here back here and then that one big up day before the pullback. IMDZ, shoulda, coulda, woulda. Yeah, that was that was another one of the uh, setups. DZ. Yeah, this one actually triggered two times, back here and then back here. The official entry on this one was right there. This was also in the course. We covered this one. And then you had another pullback back here. We talked about this one last time. Okay. Look at these good-looking setups. You guys need to get the course. CYBR. Just one's all you need. You pay for 10 years of courses. I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, this one's breaking out to do highs. I don't see anything based on the price of the stock. I don't see any reason to rush out and buy it. But if it kept going high on a pullback, sure. ACHN for Don. ACHN. Uh, well, it's breaking out to do highs, but now it's kind of come back a little bit. Um, it's got to keep on breaking out. It kind of was off to the races yesterday, and now it's already kind of stalling out. So for me to get excited, I'd have to break out like that, maybe get above 16, 17 or so, and then pull back. I hate to see it come right back in after just breaking out, okay? Now, the question is, well, Dave, did you say something about breakouts and IPOs? Yeah, well, you break out. Your, your entry on this one was actually back on this day here, if memory serves. So, yeah, that was your breakout from 9 to 15 or 9 to 14, whatever it was, on that one. A and IP, a NIP. A and IP. Uh, let's see what we got going on. Yeah, on a pullback, sure, it's trending. It's headed higher. And see, you had a wide range bar here, but then you also had a wide range bar recently, okay? Because it did kind of lose momentum and then it picked it up again. But yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. A little bit on the thin side, but that's okay. Uh, some bad memories way back here. Eh, that was a long time ago, but you can't completely forget about them. But yeah, maybe on a pullback. This would this would bother me a little bit back here. I'd have to think about that a little bit more. Uh, but on a pullback, yeah, shorter term, it looks fantastic. So can the short term overcome the, the longer term problems? The, the problems with markets is markets have long memories. So I guarantee you there are some people holding this stock up at these high levels here that are still waiting to get off the hook. Sometimes people hold for years and years. Now, as each year goes by, you know, uh, some people who owned it died. And their kids took the stock and sold it. Uh, some kid had to go to college back here. Another kid had to go to college back here. A uh, guy had an indiscretion and uh, is now divorced. He's got to sell some stock. So, you know, all these things happen to work its way through the system. Uh, the guy decides, screw it, I just want to buy a new car, I need a new house, uh, uh, whatever. Um, so a lot of that stock can work its way through the system. But markets still do have long memories. So even going back several years, you need to pay attention to what the um, overhead supply is because it can put a top on it. ADPT? ADPT. Uh, did we talk about this one? It looks okay. I mean, my problem is you, you, you break out as one big bar here, uh, but it's not bad. But I prefer if it had more follow through than this one big bar on the uptrend. It's okay. Hospitals aren't doing so well right now. That's 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 one thing that you need to have kind of in the back of your mind. Uh, take a look at hospitals themselves. 
And you could see they tried to make a recovery. It kind of looked like a high-level witch hat. And then so far, they're headed lower. See, I look at everything. That's how I know these things. And, and you can, too. Or just um, <laughs> sign up for my service, and I'll be happy to do it for you. Uh, but I know that hospitals are headed lower, so I'm going to have a hard time buying a hospital um, going against the trend. But if the setup is the greatest setup I've ever seen, then I would take it. CDTI. CDTI. Howard says CDTI started with the gap up today, pull back to the gap now. Um, reversed up long, stopped near yesterday's low. Well, I think that's dangerous to rush in and try to buy a stock because it held the gap. Um, if that's the strategy you imply, I, mean, I do have a strategy called uh, explosion gap pivots where you get a gap at new highs, not at, not at old highs or lows, I should say, where you have a gap at new highs and you look for a pullback into the gap. That's that's one thing. This is what I call a bottle rocket. Uh, Howard, I think you were at the, I want to say you were at the uh, stock selection course uh, with us back in last, back, well, oh, it's, been, it's been a year, back last November around this time. Um, my problem is it's, it looks like what I call a bottle rocket. And if you weren't in the course, go in and watch the intro webinar, which I think I covered bottle rockets somewhere in there. If you go here, stock selection course, and then on this page is an intro webinar. Watch this webinar here. There's a lot of information in this webinar, okay? And I think I covered bottle rockets. And a bottle rocket is what a stock shoots up and comes right back in. So that's kind of dangerous and speculative just to rush out and buy uh, this stock. And I hear you got to stop down here. You know, if that's how you trade, you wait for these big breakouts and then put a stop in right below the low, then then I hear you. But take a look at the HV in this thing. It's 211. I don't think I've ever traded a stock with an HV that high, or I just can't remember doing it. Um, or if I did do it, which I think I did recently, now that I'm thinking about it, I regret it because, you know, it's like it gets – the volatility gets so crazy at that point, it has no place to go, okay? Ideally, and if you go in and watch these older webinars, you'll see it, you want to capture that expansion in trend and expansion in volatility at the same time. The volatility goes to increase, and the trend goes up at the same time. I'm making a little upward hand motion. I don't know if you can see it or not, but I'm making an upward hand motion. Of course, you can see it. But the point is you want to see those both increase, and if that volatility is already that high, where does it have to go? And it, it's like after the volatility gets so extreme like this, stocks just kind of bounce around a little bit. So I think it's too dangerous to trade at this juncture. Um, but I hear you. If you got a tight stop, you think it's worth a shot, I hear you. Okay. In your first book, you state shallow pullbacks tend to longer-term, smoother continuation moves. Deeper pullbacks tend to much shorter-term and much sharper knee-jerk reactions. Do you still agree? I note that many times you state that stock has not pulled back enough. Thanks. Great show. All right, John, good point. Um, if you're in a market, an overall market, where the overall market is doing this, and having shallow pullbacks, okay, kind of like these little, they call them like a bull flag, you know, then, yeah, then the individual stocks are going to be in those continuation type of moves. So that's probably my observation based on the longer-term bull market. The the deep retracements do tend to have that knee-jerk reaction back higher, and they can make for wonderful trades, and I do like them from wonderful trades, okay, uh, but you have to take your pullbacks within context of the overall market. If the overall market is making these nice gradual pullbacks, then you can find yourself trading more and more of these bull flags in here, like a lot of uh, which I think we did in 2000. Right now, I tend to like a little bit more of a knockout type of move, a little bit more. I like that little knee-jerk reaction back up, okay? And then sometimes, like, take a look at, like, CLDX. Sometimes you can have a kind of an extreme TKO. And then you still get the, um, the best of both worlds. You'll still get that um, move higher. Probably be better just do it as a chart. Let's see something here. Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, this one back here, you can't see it, but it kind of had an extreme TKO. And then this was one of our big winners from last year. And then it went up 100%, uh, or no, I'm sorry, 200% from there. 
So Castillo makes some pretty good moves. Uh, but, yeah, as a general statement, I still believe in that, but it's got to be framed within the context of the overall market. SOYB is a bow tie? SOYB. Okay, this is the soybean fund, um, which the stock is a little thin, but I hear you. Yeah, it's kind of bottomed out in here. Um, you might want to look at the actual futures as opposed to this stock. You do have a lot of overhead supply. I don't know how that equates to the futures. I'd have to see a futures chart, which I can't pull up on this computer, um, on the fly at least. But I hear you. It's kind of bottomed out. It's trying to head higher, but I, I don't think it's tradable. AAC. Do we talk about this one? That's another hospital. Yeah, just be careful because it's a hospital. Maybe if it pull back a little tiny bit more, but not too much. It's kind of like a Goldilocks thing, you know. Uh, you don't want to pull back too far. I mean, it looks okay. I mean, you, you just had this one broad breakout. I'd probably pass based on that. Plus, it's it's real thin and speculative, which, again, sometimes as private traders, we can go in and take these VTAEs and stock, stocks like that. Uh, I'll give it an okay. I'll give it a bit of a pass because it's a, it's an um, IPO. If it was a regular stock that just broke out one bar and pulled back, I'd be less excited about it. But I hear you. It's working its way higher. It's pulling back. I think it's plausible. Look at corn instead of soybeans, all right? Yeah, see, corn looks a little bit better. And you've also, you also have taken out this supply here, and this corn is a little bit more um, liquid than the other one. So, yeah, on, on the next pullback in here, this might be a viable trade. That's a commodity. It's going to be a little choppier, be a little bumpier ride. But, yeah, I hear you, and I think that um, – I think the bottom is certainly in in corn. I agree with you on that. Good eye. VWR. VWR, we have to wrap it up really soon. Uh, this hasn't trended much yet, okay? It's only gone from 21 to 23, so watch your scaling, okay? So, I mean, if you had the, if you had the chart squeezed in, that's, that's what it would look like if you had, let's say, um, not even a 10-point scale on your screen because that's as far as it will go. But I hear you. It's making new highs, but I, I have nothing to get excited about there uh, just yet. But have it put on your watch list, okay? Okay. Let me see. Okay, we're going to have to go ahead and wrap things up because we're right around an hour and a half and change at least. So uh, let me go ahead and, um, and wrap them up. I, I have a blast in these shows. Thank you guys for showing up. I'm, I'm obviously uh, humbled by what well, may not be obvious to you, but I'm humbled by your appearance. So thanks for being here. Um, any unanswered questions, davidavelander.com. If we don't talk again, everyone have a fantastic weekend, and hopefully I'll see all you guys and our girls again uh, here next week. Thank you so much.